Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Whenever you're watching this, thank you for joining us as we continue our midweek study on lessons from the chief sinner taken from 1 Timothy. Christ came to save sinners whom I am the chief. The words of Paul and the lessons from the life of Paul. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 1. Again, Galatians chapter 1. Consider what Paul says in his writing to the church of Galatia. Yesterday, our church family received a lot of notifications of just family members who passed away, and it just really was just one right after the other, and it was just uh, heavy from thinking about what these members are going through and praying for these families and uh, just definitely want to be mindful of them and mentioning them again. Uh, we, the first one that went out earlier was uh, Frank and Joanne Hollingsworth and Joanne's son passing away, Dennis, who lived right next door to them. And just continue to keep that family in your prayers. Roger Saul's brother, Milton, him passing away. And just continue to keep that family, the Saul's family, in your prayers. And Joan Connor and the loss of her brother, he was on our prayer list. And uh, he passed away. His name was David Butler. And then Janet Parham, who is a member at Schrader Lane Church of Christ, but she has attended, um, uh, well, she's attended many times at Charlotte Heights and previously before Charlotte Heights. And uh, her, her sister, Audrey Carter, has, you know, passing away. So just a lot of, a lot of people uh, of our family, uh, church family, that are just dealing with grieving and loss and that we definitely want to be mindful of them and, and prayerful uh, to God and God will give them peace and comfort and I hope I know that you are good about praying this is a church that truly believes in praying and mentioning people and uh, through these messages that we receive to give us an opportunity to pray and to pray for people and I think that's so important and the power uh, of a prayer availeth much accomplishes much Again, we're in Galatians chapter 1. We're considering uh, lessons from the chief sinner. And tonight or today or this afternoon, I want to talk to you about taking the time. Taking the time. I believe one of the biggest problems we face, and, and I include myself, we face, is that we get to busy. We get too busy. Have you ever had a week off from work or something and you thought, well, I'm just going to do a staycation, especially with, you know, with what we've gone through with quarantining and, you know, COVID and all that. And, and it's amazing how much, even with limitations, how that week gets filled up with things you've got to do, you feel like you need to do. And before you know it, you're working as much on the week off than you did on a normal week for, for many people, not everybody, but for many. And I think, you know, the idea that us getting too busy, you know, if we can get too busy to, you know, we, we don't maybe communicate to our family like we should, we, we, we get too busy and don't communicate to the friends that are close to us like we, we want to do. And we would add God to that. Let's be honest. We get too busy even for God. Let me ask you something very openly and honestly. When was the last time you were purpose? You were purposeful about spending time with God. What I mean by that is this. You made arrangements for it. You blocked out your schedule, your part of your day for God. You turned off your phone you, you, you closed your computer, iPad, whatever devices, the TV was not on. Everything was off and, and to give your um, uh, full attention to being with God. You know, if, if you struggle, if you're really honest, to, to think of a time where you were intentional about that, then don't, I don't want you to feel guilty about that. Because I think we struggle with that. We get easily just so filled up with the non-essentials of life that 
we feel like it's essential because we're in the moment of it, but after it all said and done, it really, in the grand scheme of things, really is not that essential. You know, I, I, thinking about this lesson and putting it together, I loved uh, the experience of, of retreats and going on retreats when I was a part of a youth group, uh, doing youth retreats and then doing church retreats and going somewhere like a state park or some cabin somewhere and just having a schedule. You're just away from home and you're in this schedule and you're making time out for devotionals and singing and reflection and sometimes going off and having quiet time, just things like that, things that we normally wouldn't do if we were at home and it was just a normal Saturday or a, a, a normal Friday night. And so when you think about moments like that, I, I want us to reflect on tonight's or today's lesson. As we think about the chief center, that is, that is Paul, and, and, and for us to seek time to be, to be mindful, to be intentional about wanting to seek time to be with God in prayer and to be with God in his word. You know, I don't think we need to do that. We don't need to be on a retreat. We don't need to be at a park somewhere. We don't need to block out a week of our vacation time. That I think we can be intentional about that in our day-to-day -day life, giving the time that we should give to God that we serve. As we think about uh, Saul, who is in his conversion we looked at last week, and his road to Damascus, his road experience, and then um, the availability of Ananias, and Ananias helping him, and why are you waiting, arise, being baptized, washing away your sins, and just, just this transformation that Saul was taking place. And from Acts 9 and what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, we have to piece together that this time period of Paul and his, his newfound faith, if you will, in Christ... He didn't run to Jerusalem to be where the apostles were. Uh, he didn't jump into the, the, the thick of things, if you will. There was the immediately of, of, of working with the people there in Damascus, but he wasn't not at the foot feet of people, that he was not taught by people as we think of being, being taught, but it, but it was through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And... Paul spent some time, some necessary time, I think, for him and his growth in this newfound faith, not only for him, but maybe for people and their reception of him. It could have been on both sides of that. And I want us to look at this point of Paul's life as we're considering lessons that he can provide for us. And, and again, I, I, let me say as we study this, we, I'm not suggesting we take sabbaticals, we take a year off, we take a summer off. Um, I, I do think we can, though, carve out some time uh, in, in our day or in a weekend for God. And, and let me say this. If, if, if we're way too busy to do that, then we're too busy with the things that really don't matter eternally. And we need to reassess the things that we are busy with in our lives. The first thing I want to share with you is this. Others who had their retreat to grow. What about Moses? Moses' life, and we've talked about Moses before, and his life of 40s and the first 40 years there in the palace and the environment that he had and the gold, the nice apparel, the fine food and so forth, and just very pampered, if you will, particularly compared to others and other of that society and of that culture. But Moses uh, saw one of the Egyptians uh, beating one of his people, and he murders that Egyptian. And he leaves, and he runs, and he goes into the land of, uh, of Midian, into the plains of Midian. And there he, he, he marries the daughter of a local priest. And he would spend the next 40 years uh, tending his father-in-law's sheep. Now, that's a pretty extreme transition. You go from life in the palace 
the hustle and bustle of people coming in and out and everything going on with the display and with the, just the noise level and so forth to the open plains of Midian with your father-in-law's sheep for 40 years. But that time was needed for Moses when, at the age of 80 when God called him in that burning bush that wasn't burning, consumed by fire, to call him to lead God's people. That time of retreat was a time for him to grow and to learn things that he would not maybe not have learned if he was busy doing something else. David, David was anointed king of Israel while still in his youth, but Saul was still king. And, so, and David didn't go and dethrone Saul. So he would spend 13 years as a fugitive, hiding in caves, hiding from the, 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 the craziness of Saul wanting to take David's life and the threat that David was to him in his life. And so David was not immediately, you know, once he was anointed as king, he didn't immediately t- take the throne. That 13, time, 13 years on the run and in retreating, and there's a lot of psalms from David in reflecting on that and hiding and someone coming after him and trying to hide from that and not wanting to you know, take away from whom God anointed, if you will. What about Joseph? We mentioned we've, we spent some time with Joseph, you know, uh, sold uh, into slavery and with Potiphar and then uh, what took place there in his Potiphar's home with Potiphar's wife and you know, Joseph was an innocent man. He left, but Potiphar's wife accused him of something that he did not know. He was put into prison, and there he stayed for over two years uh, for doing something that he didn't do at all. He was, he was innocent of the crime. But Joseph learned things while he was in the dungeon, not knowing if he would ever see the light of day. But it prepared him for something that was much greater that God had planned. When I think about men like this and other men and women who had moments, what I would call moments of retreat, where they're not busy doing things, they're not at the mountaintop, they're not experiencing the greatest of their zenith of their life, but they're in the law, if you will, of things that are happening that uh, they didn't plan, they didn't, they didn't foresee, but it was things that was needed for them to grow and to be who we know them to be for us today. They didn't move on the spot that God wanted them immediately. That's what I want you to think about. I believe we struggle with waiting. I believe we struggle with learning to be patient over a period of time in a culture that is just so consumed with instant gratification. We want it right here. We want it right now. We want to feel what we want to feel right now. And we don't want to wait. We don't want to work at it. We don't want to put in time and, and, and get to that point. We want to get to point A to point B immediately as fast as possible. But life is so precious and life is so valuable. And for us to be satisfied with just simply a surface level relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is not good enough. It's just not good enough. Jesus gave us too much. He offered too much. He sacrificed far too much for just a surface level type relationship with him. For us to get so busy with the earthly things that we don't have enough time for him. We should all strive for a deep, meaningful relationship with our Lord. But to get there doesn't take a day, it doesn't take a week, it doesn't take a month, it takes time. It takes considerable amount of time to get to, as James prescribes, for us to reach a spiritual maturity about us where we're not lacking anything. It takes willingness, it takes determination, it takes whatever time that is needed for us to get to that point in our life with our faith. We now come finally to Paul and Paul, what I call his desert retreat. Paul was pierced, no doubt about it, by being blinded on the road on his way as he was nearing Damascus, hearing the words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the availability of Ananias coming in there and helping him. 
Paul became a Christian, but God had only begun with Paul. Paul needed time. He needed time to grow. He needed time to be and to develop. He needed time to reflect. He needed time to realize the importance of who he was. And we see some of this as Paul reflects on this in hindsight in Galatians chapter 1 uh, as he's writing to the church there of Galatia. And I want to read it. It's in verse, beginning in verse 10 of Galatians chapter 1. For, for do I not persuade men or God? Or do I not seek, do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant or a servant or a slave of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for neither received it from man, nor was it taught, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. He was taught by Jesus. For you have heard of my former conduct in, Jeru in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's room and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. Three years in Arabia and going to Damascus. If you look in Acts chapter 9, after he was strengthened in that experience with Ananias, it says in verse 20, immediately he preached Christ in the synagogue that he's the son of God. And Saul increased in all more in strength and as he dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. I think part of these three years in Sarabia, which Damascus is not far on the edge of Arabia, wherever that particular part of Arabia that Paul was dwelling at, yes, he was doing some of that, but yet he was receiving a revelation of Jesus Christ. And I would think there would be some downtime, if you will, for, for Paul to reflect to re-examine his life, to reaffirm what took place, and to be who he became, as we know him as the great church planner and the great missionary. I think it's interesting, if you go back and look what we read in Galatians chapter 1, especially at the end, he didn't consult with whom? He did not consult with flesh and blood. What does that mean? He didn't consult with people. He didn't go around Damascus learning from other teachers of the word like we would do. He didn't go back to Jerusalem to learn from apostles. He received not from man, but he received from the revelation of, from Jesus Christ. But secondly, not only did he not confer with flesh and blood, he did not run back to Jerusalem after what he experienced in Damascus. He didn't run to present himself to those who were privileged to have walked and talked and spent time with Jesus the apostles. He did, he did not go to consult with other Christian leaders of the church there in Jerusalem. But he went to a place called Arabia. Why? What was the purpose? Well, we don't know exactly where in Arabia. We know he was in Damascus, but he was also in Arabia, which was near Damascus. But yet, as you think about Arabia, as we think of Saudi Arabia today, and we think of the Sahara, we think of desert, we think of... Uh, of, of a dry area, and then that's not far removed of where Paul was, kind of where he was at. I picture this barren wilderness, for the most part, d deserted as he was in between what he was doing there in Damascus. Why did he go there? Why not go to Jerusalem? Why not go and spend time with Peter and learn from those apostles that were with Jesus? Why not share what happened to him, his experience? Well, Paul in Galatians 1 really doesn't give us a reason why he spent three years in Arabia before going to Jerusalem to spend 15 days with Peter. It was a time for Paul only? It was a time also maybe for Christians to hear about what was taking place in Damascus, especially those in Jerusalem? the one that was known as the terrorist among them, 
that were placing men and women in prison that was there at the feet when Stephen was being stoned to death, that he was now a brother in Christ? Do you think someone like that kind of reputation needed some time? Maybe. You think maybe while Paul was in Arabia that maybe that he took time to reflect? He took the time to meditate, to pray. He took the time to be in communion with God. I believe this, if I may call a desert retreat for Paul, was what was needed for him. It would seem to me convicted the way he was and before becoming and being and being such a rock, a firm foundation for the church. Uh, in its growth in the first century. Uh, Paul uh, getting to that point. That again, it didn't happen overnight. He spent that time there in that region. I think we could take in closing the lesson from the chief sinner in his time in Arabia and taking that time that maybe we need to slow down for God rather than speed up and hurry up for the fast pace of this world. I wonder, are we guilty of doing that with God? Quickening our prayers, quickening our Bible reading, quickening the time that we spend with Him because we got to do this, 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 and that. I got to answer this, and I got to go and do, you know, I, we just got to be so busy. And you remember in the story with Jesus when, and Mary and Martha, Martha was busy in doing this and that in the house, but Mary was at the feet of Jesus. And who did Jesus commend? He commended Mary. Maybe the lesson for us is maybe we need to listen and reflect more than do the talking. Maybe we just need to look around and look up and just think about what we know and what we've learned about God and just, just looking at things and how we can see God more clearly and what, we're, what God's presented to us instead of us doing the talking and explaining and convincing. Maybe we need to follow the path of other people before us and see the need to take a retreat and in that retreat make that time available for God. Whatever you put on hold, if you do that, whatever you put on hold can wait. It will have to wait because our growth and our development of our faith in our Lord is worth it, not only for ourselves, but it is worth it with God. Let's pray. Father God, I come to you at this time and just uh, mindful of those we mentioned at the very beginning, Janet, passing of her uh, sibling, mentioning also of Joanne and the passing of her son, Joan, the passing of her brother, as well as Roger and the passing of of his brother. Just pray for these families and pray for others who have lost loved ones recently and just continue your hand to be upon them, encourage them, be with them, and uh, just pray that you'll bless them. I pray that the, this lesson that we've heard can be a blessing to us and we can be mindful of just the importance of just taking the time to be still and know you and to be more mindful of that. Maybe then we are in our life. We are grateful and thankful for all that you do, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.